Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna devotees, Hare Krishna God family and our extended family. Welcome again to our last day, unfortunately, but thank you for being here. So our humble obeisances, all glories to Sri Prabhupada and all glories to our Gurudev and Vaishnavas online. So today we just wanted to say once again, if you can keep your microphones on mute, and also cameras, if you can have them switched off while the session is on, we'd appreciate that. Once again, if you have questions about the sessions, then please can you direct them to Radha Bhakti so that it causes less interference when the session is on. Also, quickly, we've had quite a few um, requests about donation to this seminar. So if you would like to donate, um, Ekta Shah is, we've put her email, or we're going to put her email on the chat and you can contact her directly if you wish to donate. So today I would just like to start off because this morning um, our Guru Maharaj kindly let us know what auspicious day it was today. So I'm going to just read something about today. It's just two sentences. So today is Akshaya Tirtya. Bear with me. And Akshatirtya is a very special day in the Vedic calendar. So Akshaya means inexhaustible. Anything a person undertakes on the day of Akshaya Tirtya is bound to succeed, especially the performance of devotional activities, which guarantees inexhaustible benefits. So I thought, what a beautiful day to end with our seminar today. I just thought I'd share that with everybody online before we start. So on that note, with the Bhavana, I think you heard it's a lovely day for your seminar and to start us off. I was thinking about what you, the title of this session. And I thought, jewels, I mean, jewels of the journey. I can't wait, personally. I thought you'd actually given us all the king, you know, kingdom knowledge, like in the Bhagavad Gita. We actually thought you'd actually given us the kingdom knowledge, but you actually want to give us the jewels as well. So thank you. <laughs> you can't wait. So on this point, if you're ready with the Bhavana Prabhu, we are ready to go. Okay. Thank you very much, Shippa Mataji. Thank you for the wonderful introduction. Okay, so we'll say Mangala Char and then we'll, we'll take it forward from there. Omegyana Timiranda Siya Gyananjana Shilakaya Jekshu Militam Yena Tasmaya Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Bishtam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Gadamayam Dadati Swapadanti Kam Vandeham Shri Guru Shri Yuta Padakamalam Shri Gurun Vaishnavamscha. Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Raghunatam Vitam Tvam Sajiva. Sadvaitam Savadutam Virjana Saitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam. Shri Radha Krishna Padam Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishikam Vitamscha. Hey Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Chikatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostate. Dabta Kanchana Gorangi. Radhe Vrindavaneshvari Vrishabhanu Sutadevi Pranamami Hari Priye Vanchikal Patrubhyas Cha Kripa Sindhu Bhyevacha Patita Nam Bhavanebhyo Vaishnavebhyo Namo Namaha Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhupada Shri Advaita Gadadar Shri Vasadi Gaura Bhakta Rinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare. So we first will request um, the blessings of His Holiness Chan Muli Maharaj, our seniors on the call and all the assembled Vaishnavas and Vaishnavis. Um, as we go to this um, third presentation, um, as Shilpa Mataji said, this is called Jewels on the journey. So we're looking at the qualities of pure devotional service. 
it is a fact that in Kali Yuga, it is characterized by different things. So we hear um, that Kali Yuga is the age of quarrel and it's the age of hypocrisy. Right? So we understand that the, the time that we are living in has certain defining characteristics. In Kali Yuga, according to Shastra, it's natural to find that there'll be quarrel or conflict. And it's also natural to find that there'll be hypocrisy. What I've been trying to do over the last, I don't know how many years, is really try to, try to reflect on the teachings and to understand what, what is implied by this. What is the teaching trying to tell us? So on this point, we can first understand that because it's the age of quarrel, that we will, we will see that there will be disagreements. There will be different points of view. There will be opposing ways of seeing the same thing. That has a practical implication. If we know that quarrel permeates the environment, then the implication is that any community, any family, any partnership that is able to stay together in a healthy way is one which has learned to deal with disagreement in a healthy way. Right? So there's an implication. We also know that Kali Yuga is the age of hypocrisy. So what is hypocrisy? Hypocrisy means that the packaging does not necessarily match what's inside the package. Right? So we, we live in a marketing culture whereby you can have something which is a very low value, but it's wrapped up in such a nice way that we, we, we spend time, effort and money to attain it only to be disappointed later on. So in Kali Yuga, unfortunately, people are attuned much more to form than to substance. People are much more attuned to how something looks on the surface than how something is actually at its core. But because we have that mentality in Kali Yuga, there's also a very interesting implication for us as devotees. Because we know that Kali Yuga or in Kali Yuga, people are much more attuned to how something appears to be because we know in Kali Yuga that people are attuned to how something is marketed or presented or advertised, it is also important for us to do two things. One is to present our teachings as attractively as possible. And two, and this is what we're gonna to do today, the second thing we need to do is internal marketing we will become convinced to go along this journey. We call this presentation the jewels of the journey. We will become deeply, strongly determined and convinced to really apply our journey of Krishna consciousness when we understand the great blessings, benefits and attributes of the journey itself. Okay, so what we're going to be doing in this session is internal marketing. We will be hearing, reflecting with a view to convincing ourselves at a very, very deep level about the power, the potency, and the great experiences or milestones on this journey from where we are back to pure loving devotion at the lotus feet of Sri Krishna. Okay, so these jewels of the journey are really important to reflect on. And, and we did emphasize this before, but I'll say it again. As we go through these things, I'm going to encourage you, especially with Maharaj's lectures, to hear them again. Take your time, dissect them bit by bit. Take a point and just pause for a moment and just think about that point. What, what is being said here? We often, we often talk about how the teachings are like a voice. So again, shravanam. We hear the voice. 
of the scripture. We hear the voice of Guru Sadhu Shastra. But when we reflect on it, we reflect on what we heard, what we read, it is like the echo of the voice, right? It allows us to have that repetition. Like you, you say something in a cave, you say it once, but you can hear the sound reverberating. So we want to literally have the teachings reverberating within our own consciousness. And what does that reverberation do? First of all, it deepens the samskar. It deepens the, it, it entrenches that rich wisdom more and more deeply into the consciousness. So that even when we are challenged, even in times of, of challenge, the, the samskar, the remembrance of what we learned has gone so deeply into our consciousness, it becomes like a tree with deep roots. A few years ago, and actually I think earlier this year, there were some gale force winds. And in that situation, some trees were completely uprooted, especially the trees which had very shallow roots. Because when the tree has shallow roots, then the gale force winds can really pull that tree up and away from its foundation. But the opposite is also true. When the roots of a tree are very deep, and that deepness comes by the roots going very, very deep into the core of the earth and being very deeply nourished, then no matter what the challenges that come, no matter how strong the gale force winds are, the tree remains stable, strong, and grounded. So the very practice of us hearing and discussing together, the more that it's taken advantage of, the more that we ground ourselves in devotion. When we were speaking to um, the South African devotees, we were making the point that life has challenges. Not you, nor I, and not anyone fully understands the challenges that we may face in life. And for many people, it can be a cause of anxiety. But there's another way to look at this. Although I cannot control the challenges that may pop into my life space at various points on my, on my journey between birth and death, what I do have more control over is how deep I cultivate my devotional roots. The more deeply I cultivate my devotional roots, the more deeply I create the capacity and the spiritual resilience to withstand and to prosper in whatever situations or challenges that may come. So as we were explaining in the previous talk, the, the quality of our response in a crisis, in a challenge, is directly related to the quality of our cultivation. So Krishna, he arranges our life like episodes. In fact, Krishna consciousness itself, the journey is like a great epic. So we are all living in our own Mahabharat or in our own Ramayan. This, this great epic on this journey back home, back to Godhead. It is a journey filled with great insight. It is a journey filled with great adventure. It's a, it's a journey filled with great joy and a journey in which it is filled with great insight or enlightenment. Because as we go through the journey, we are constantly illuminated. Things that we had, we had not known before we come to realize. Things that we had only imagined we come to experience. And we can always prepare ourselves for that journey. Um, as my own spiritual master would often say, he said that um, you can understand how well you've been preparing in class when the test comes. So this, this sharing, as we reflect on it more and more, it is like deepening our preparedness for the next test. Oftentimes, many of us, we did not like the education system, but the education system in Krishna consciousness is not a bad thing. In fact, 
the education system in Krishna consciousness is something extremely brilliant. People may say, I don't like exams, but there's something on the other side of every exam if we pass the test. Whenever we pass a test in Krishna consciousness, we break through to a greater experience of Krishna consciousness. And what we're going to speak about in this verse from Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, so we're going to be reading from 1117, which explains the qualities of pure devotional service. As we go into this, we're going to talk about pure devotional service in three categories. And Maj touched upon this a few days ago. Two of these six qualities of pure devotional service, which we're going to read from, two of them relate to pure devotional service in practice. Two of them relate to what we call bhava bhakti, pure devotional service in ecstasy. And two of the qualities which we'll elaborate on relate to pure devotional service in pure loving devotion. And these are milestones on the journey. After we pass every test, we break through to a superior experience in Krishna consciousness. And so one way that we can frame our entire lives is that we're preparing for an exam. Mm -hmm. And the exam can come in our lives at different points on the journey. But the wonderful thing is that Krishna not only loves us, <laughs> But Krishna, he can also be a bit mischievous, right? So someone who's a bit mischievous, what do they do? A mischievous person may enter into the exam with the answers. A mischievous person, if they really like the people that they are around, not only can they enter into the exam with the answers, but they can feed their friends the answers. Don't look, um, don't show anyone but here's the answer to the, to the questions that are coming on the exam. Many of us will have had the experience in our own Krishna consciousness that Krishna, because of his deep and undying love for his devotees, he will often give us some sign, some heads up, some, some answers before the exam occurs. We may hear something in the class. We may receive an instruction from the spiritual master. We may read something in a book which is directly relevant to a situation that we are facing or that we are about to face. And that is just another, it's just another way of Krishna expressing his undying affection for his devotees. He wants us to know that he is there, he cares for us, and he wants us to come to him. Okay, let's start. So we're going to read from Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, 1117. And this is a very wonderful verse from Rupa Goswami in which he describes the six distinguishing characteristics of pure devotional service. So I'll read the translation. Pure devotional service brings immediately, immediate relief from all kinds of material distress. It is the beginning of all auspiciousness. It minimizes the value of liberation. It is rarely achieved. It automatically puts one in transcendental pleasure. And it is the only means to attract Krishna. Okay. So there are six characteristics which we're going to get into. But just one other point on this internal marketing. You see... There's, it's one thing to say something, but what a person truly believes and has conviction in is based upon how they behave, is shown by how they behave. So it has a symptom. So when we read and reflect and we allow the teachings to go deep into our consciousness, the deeper they go, they, the more that they, trans, they transform our activities and the more that they align us with the goal. There was, um, there was a teacher, a martial arts teacher, and he was teaching a student how to, how to punch. So in martial arts, when they learn to punch, there's, there's, there's a real science to it. And um, 
actually I was learning this. I was learning, not didn't learn it for long, but when I was much younger, I was I was enrolling in this class in jujitsu. And I remember when the teacher was teaching us how to punch. And he explained something to me that I, I never forgot. He said that when you come to punch, he said, you do not aim to you do not aim at the person's body. And I, I thought that was a very strange thing to say. He said, you do not aim at the person's body. He said, when you, when, you, when you punch, what you do is you understand where your opponent is and you aim about a meter behind that person. And he went on to explain why. He said, what happens is if your aim is beyond the person's body, then as your fist approaches the person's body, it's able to accelerate. And therefore, it moves swiftly beyond the person's body to the actual point at which it was being directed. And I was thinking about this in relation to pure devotional service. If our aim does not lie beyond the material world, then we will be easily disturbed, stopped, challenged, put on the back foot whenever we meet different um, let's say, obstacles or exams on the path. We are more affected by the worldly because we do not have our aim firmly established on the transcendental. So we want you to really think about that. We want you to really think, how can I anchor my consciousness on the transcendental platform? Just, just take a moment because... That's a very powerful concept. If I'm able to reflect on the goal, if I'm able to reflect, and we'll do this together, on the jewels of the journey, then I become like the student. There's a student in every university, there's a student and their aim is to get a first class degree. And they've been thinking about it, they've been meditating about it for a long time. And because they're so deeply rooted in that first class attainment. Therefore, all their effort is aligned with that topmost aim. And because their effort is, in, is on that platform, they will easily achieve at least a 2-2 or a 2-1 because they're firmly fixed on the goal of getting a first class degree. If, however, their aim is just a 2-1 or a 2-2, they may not even at attain that. So we're like that student. Let's be very honest. Many of us as devotees, we're not really fixed on the goal. And therefore, when the reversals of life come, we become easily disturbed. But, but today, and hopefully as we go on, we're going to use the teachings practically to anchor our consciousness on the goal by understanding these different milestones. What constitutes a C grade? What constitutes a B grade? What constitutes an A grade so I can meditate on that? And as I meditate on that, it becomes an anchor which propels me more strongly to the goal. Okay, so this definition spoke about the six qualities of pure devotional service. And we'll explain a few points before we move on. And that is that Vishnu Chakravali Thakur, for example, he he elaborates on some points in this, in this regard. He elaborates on the fact that ecstatic devotion, so we said there's pure devotion in practice. This is called sadhana bhakti. There's pure devotion in ecstasy, right? In, in um, ecstatic emotion. This is called bhava bhakti. And there's pure devotion in pure love. This is called prema bhakti. Now it's interesting, practice is one category, ecstasy is another ca category, and then pure love is a different category. So a question can arise, is devotional service in ecstasy, is it part of the category of practice, or is it part of the category of pure love? And Vishnath Chakravali Thakur says that ecstatic emotion is the goal of devotional service in practice. In other words, on that journey, this first category, 
practicing devotional service, sadhana bhakti, its goal is ecstatic emotion. Okay? So it can't be considered exactly part of the category of sadhana bhakti because it's the goal of sadhana bhakti. At the same time, bhava bhakti does not have all the features of prema bhakti. It doesn't have all the features of devotional um, service in prema bhakti, in pure love. Therefore, it's not completely in the category of perfection. Okay, so therefore, it is in a category of its own, although it has something of the qualities of devotional service in practice, and it has something, something in, in a seed like form in relation to devotional service in pure love, prema bhakti. Okay, so it has the mature emotions resulting from devotional service in practice. Okay, so devotional service, as we practice it, it, it helps us to build up to that point of devotional service in bhava bhakti, in, pure, in ecstatic emotion. It's the, it has that maturing of emotion. It also has the seedling, the seed of perfection found in the blossoming stage of love. So, there's, so it's almost like a, an intermediary category. So Rupa Goswami describes the six categories of pure devotional service, and I'm going to list them for you, okay? And there are two for each stage. So, first of all, devotional service in practice. The two qualities here, which we, which we read. One is that it brings immediate relief from material distress. And the second one is that it's the beginning of all auspiciousness. Okay, so these are two qualities from devotional service in practice. Then we have devotional service in ecstasy. One quality is that it minimizes the value of liberation. So one does not care to become liberated from the material situation. And the second quality of devotional service in ecstasy is that it's very rarely achieved. And then the third category, pure devotional service in pure love. The first quality is that it puts one in transcendental pleasure. And the second quality is that it's the only means to attract Krishna. Okay, so let's discuss these six as they relate to the different categories. Okay, now the first two um, qualities. So now we're talking about sadhana bhakti or devotional service in practice. The first two qualities, that's immediately, immediate relief from material distress and the beginning of all auspiciousness. These two qualities reveal themselves according to our progress in sadhana. So therefore, as we go on the journey, we have to be very, as Maharaj said, very patient. Because the more that we progress in our devotional practice, the more that we experience both relief from material distress and the arising of auspiciousness. Okay, so let's explore this in a bit more detail. So, as our devotional service matures, our progress in, in devotional service, it doesn't grow at the same pace, it starts to accelerate. And so those two particular qualities are developing as we are moving closer on our journey towards, ultimately towards Krishna, as we're moving and making progress in that particular journey. Now, let's explore this point about relief from distress. So in the material world, we all have this experience. We can be distressed by various unfortunate changes, reversals, circumstances. And the majority of people, they just try to control or exert control in the outside world. What we try to do is to transform our consciousness. And because consciousness is what we, we experience the world through, then by transforming our consciousness, we literally transform our ability to handle anything that life throws at us. It, it, is, it is amazing to think about this point. 
the amount of time and energy that most people have put into trying to control external situations. If they would just direct even a fraction of that same time and energy towards working on their own consciousness, they would transform their entire experience of life. That is just how powerful Maya is, right? This illusory energy. Think about that. Think about that in your own life. How much time and energy we've wasted in trying to control everyone else and everything else if we'd pull a fraction of that time, if we'd been more efficient to invest even a fraction of that time towards working on our own Krishna conscious development. We will transform the way that we experience things. We will transform the decisions that we make. We will transform the association that we keep. We would make an investment in a superior way and we would ex be experiencing a far deeper, more transcendental, more blissful and more fulfilling experience of life at, in, at every moment. And, and that, that is quite incredible. So what is it that Maya does? Maya is the person who tricks us into investing in that which does not give a, a, a proper res response. It is like investing in a bad business. Because we've invested time and energy in the wrong thing, we lose out. Um, what is it that Prabhupada said? He made a comment, I can't remember it totally. He said, if, if one, um, you know, if one gives, if one gives time and energy to that which is temporary, rather than that which is eternal, one loses in both, in both respects, right? So we're giving all of our time and energy to that which is temporary, but it's gonna go anyway, okay? So you've, you've invested in something that is bound to leave you. Huh? But if we invest in that which is eternal, there's no loss, because that, that progress, it, it stands forever. So Krishna consciousness is literally the highest investment that any living entity can make. Okay. Let's explore this a bit more. So this idea of distress. So it is explained that the relief that comes from the distress of past deeds, it comes by taking shelter of the full potency of devotional service. So we're trying to be more and more convinced, and this is also a nimitta, this is also a symptom. We can see what we have faith in, we can see what we are convinced about by what we take shelter of. And literally all of the teachings are there, all the classes are there to convince us about the, the power of devotional service, the strength of devotional service, the, the fortitude of devotional service. In other words, it's there to help us to understand that this is a real shelter, this is a real ashraya for us. If you take shelter of something which is transcendental, it will actually, it, it actually, not only will it protect you, but it has the power, the attributes, and the quality, the capability to protect us. But if you take shelter of something which is material, you're in trouble because your shelter, it can't stand, it can't withstand the test of time. The material energy itself is vulnerable, therefore it cannot give you shelter. It cannot give us shelter. So, once we get transcendental knowledge, once we practice and get transcendental knowledge, it is really important for us as devotees in order to stop behaviors, sinful behaviors, because if we do not do so, we further create miseries for ourselves. Sometimes devotees will not take proper shelter of the process, They'll therefore find experiences which are negative, which are painful, and then they'll wonder what's happening. But when we examine the life, we see actually you're still engaging in sinful activities. So because you're still engaging in sinful activities, you're still creating literally more distress to come upon you in your own life. So we have to be very careful to stop that, right? Through the understanding, and this is key, through transcendental understanding, it helps us to understand the act and the react. It helps us to understand a particular deed and what will be the repercussions or the reactions to a particular activity. 
sometimes people who are more materially oriented, they can't understand why a devotee doesn't want to eat meat. But anyone who's a devotee, who has even a, a, a basic understanding, very quickly comes to understand through both knowledge and through the higher taste of prashadam, they come to understand why would you, wh once, you once you understand the higher experience of prashadam, no one who is at least a little bit progressive in transcendental knowledge would willingly put a dead corpse in their own mouth. You see, someone said that Krishna consciousness is like the mafia. Once you join, you can never leave because you know too much. And that is what transcendental knowledge does. Transcendental knowledge is like x-ray vision. It allows me to see through the propositions that the material world puts before me. I can see what's being offered and I can see the conclusion or the reaction of what's being offered. And therefore, I can make a more insightful decision at every moment about what I will and will not accept. You see, that's how it works. So it's explained that there is a chain and, and the chain of bad behavior begins with avidya. Avidya means ignorance. So ignorance is actually explained in our teachings to be the root cause of suffering. So because I have an uninformed understanding of what will make me happy, I engage in material behavior. If I have an informed understanding of my, and Prabhupada says this, what is he, he says, um, they do not know their own self-interest. Because I lack an informed understanding of my own self-interest, I, I become deviated to do things which will actually cause me suffering. And, and to be honest with you, it's an incredible, this Shastra Chak shoes is an incredible vision. It's like x-ray vision. It has, it has, it gives us x-ray vision in terms of principle, but it even gives x-ray vision in terms of detail. If you understand and, and imbibe this spiritual vision, even the situations of other people, you look at it and you can see through it, you can see what the repercussions are going to be for someone. It is, abs it is a priceless gift that has been given by Prabhupada. So what does Prabhupada say? He says, people make bad decisions because of a poor fund of knowledge. You see, we don't just deal with the material world. Everything you see in the material world, you attribute a certain understanding to it, right? Everything, whether it's a member of the opposite sex, whether it's money, whether it's um, a, a particular material pursuit, you look at it and you attribute a certain understanding to that particular thing to that particular opportunity. So if the understanding that you attribute to each opportunity in life, to each decision is proper, that means it's based upon our teachings, you will naturally navigate your life in a way that brings you to higher states of spiritual consciousness. But if you have the wrong understanding, if you have the wrong attachment, then we get pulled into things which ultimately cause us suffering later on okay so the root cause of this negative chain of suffering it begins with avidya that avidya leads to two different things it leads to what we call pop which is sinful behavior but it also leads to material desires it plants the seed it's called the beach of material desires so we are we have a desire to do something materialistic and we have the sinful behavior itself, the sin. And when we engage in that sin, it leads to a reaction. The reaction has two parts. There is the visible reaction that we're experiencing, the parabda. There is also the reactions which are to come, right? So, when, so I have stolen from someone in the past and I've not immediately experienced the negative repercussions from stealing from that person. But because I have stolen, it is only a question of time before I will get a reaction from that sinful behavior. And that unmanifest, but coming, 
that unmanifest reaction that is on its way, that is called aparabdha. It's very interesting. At the end of the Kurukshetra War, um, Dhritarashtra, he asked a question. And he asked a question which was, why was it that I was born blind and that my 100 sons had to die? That's the question that he asked. And the answer that he was given was that 50 lifetimes ago, he was a hunter. And he shot a flaming arrow into a nest of birds. It killed the birds in that nest, 100 birds. But the parent bird escaped. But the fire from the, from the flaming arrow, it seared the eyes of the, that parent bird. You see, a hundred lifetimes ago, he was told this, this happened. And he asked a further question. He said, I understand that I did that, but that was, sorry, that was 50 lifetimes ago. Not a hundred lifetimes, 50 lifetimes ago. He said, but why was it that I got the reaction now? And he was told it took a certain number of lifetimes for him to come to the point of having 100 sons. So we all have this. We all have things that we've done in the past and the reaction is on its way, but it has yet to manifest. And one of the forms of the reactions to our previous behaviors, which are manifest, is the body that we have. The kind of physical body that we have is actually a reaction to our previous behaviors. You know, it's interesting. We hear this verse in the Bhagavad Gita, Ante Kale Chama Meva, Smaran Mutbav Kale Varam, Ya Parati Samad Bhavam, Ya Ti Sam Shayaha. That whatever state one attains at the time of death, whatever we think about at the time of death, that will determine the type of body we have in the next life. Now, there's also, we also hear that the activities that we perform and the type of consciousness we develop also determines the type of body we have in our next life. And we see the example in the Bhagavatam. So we have Bharat Maharaj. Now, what happened to Bharat Maharaj? Towards the end of his life, he became attached to a deer. And because he became attached to a deer, therefore, that was, that was the attachment at that time of death. Therefore, in his next life, he took birth in the body of a deer. So our bodies are also the reaction to previous deeds, etc. Now, unfortunately, the story does not end there. Sinful actions also produce what we call a kuta. That is an inclination to engage in that seed, in that sinful activity again. And it also creates that seed that of, of producing more sinful activity. So a seed then sprouts into the desire to do more sinful activities. Now, there's a very interesting point here, and that is that therefore, when we engage in sinful activity, it actually produces not just bad reactions, but it produces an inclination to sin again, right? This is actually the root behind so many addictions that are there in modern society. There are now people who are addicted to pornography, people who are addicted to sex, People are addicted to drugs, people are addicted to alcohol, and they know it's wrong and they cannot give it up. And our scriptures explain why. Because what's happened is they've, they've reinforced this inclination. Right? And, and that's also, interestingly enough, why people take birth with an inclination. I, I'll be honest, I have a friend of mine, and he told me he had, the, he had a reading done. And he was given a warning. We were speaking about this many years ago at the Iskon London Temple. As a friend of mine who I haven't seen for many years, but he showed me a reading he had done. And what he was told was it was incredibly insightful. He was told that in his previous life, he had engaged in intoxication, specifically taking drugs. And he was warned that because of that, your subtle body has, has a weakness in this area. You have this, as we said, this inclination, this kuta for this behavior. And he was warned, therefore, in this life, you have to be especially careful. Do not get involved in intoxication because it's bad for everyone. But because you already have this negative inclination from a previous life, if you do it, it will really bring you down. 
I remember being at the temple in London and we had this discussion. He told me that. He was from a very wealthy family. And unfortunately, he got back into that behavior. And, and to our billions, it is heartbreaking. I remember going to visit him. He was, he was, he'd been sectioned. He was, he was staying in the mental institution, a hospital. And I remembered going to, to visit him and they were giving him regular, like some drugs, all kinds of things. And it was, it was shocking because what, what Krishna had shown me was just how accurate the, the warning that he'd been given was. And it was just, like, just, I think a few years ago that he was let out of that mental institution, right? Because what, what had happened was by him taking drugs, he started having hallucinations. He started, he started seeing certain subtle entities. You know, it's a whole very, very negative story. So it's very, very important to understand that when we start to engage in addictive activity, sinful activity, it's not just, I can control it, it, that it can really bring us down. And, and people are born with different weaknesses. It's not that everyone is born with the same weakness. Because of previous life behaviors, every single one of us will have certain inherent subtle weaknesses. Now, devotional service is so powerful that if we just follow properly, it takes care of everything. But if we're not careful, we can, you can trigger almost like a mental landmine that can really bring you down in your, in your, not just in your Krishna consciousness, but in your entire life in general. Okay, so we have to learn to tolerate different urges and the power to tolerate them comes from the power of Krishna consciousness. Yeah? And to take proper shelter, as we said, we need to be convinced of the power of devotional service by understanding through the teachings, through Guru Sadhu Shastra, just how powerful devotional service is. You see? Now, it's a very interesting point here. Uttama Bhakti, pure devotional service, is actually like Krishna. What do I mean by that? Pure devotional service like Krishna, is all-powerful. I repeat that. Pure devotional service, like Krishna, is, is all-powerful. I remember, I remember being in a class by His Holiness Tamal Krishnamaraj at Iskon London. And he, he made a point. He said that all religions that say that God is the greatest, except us. We do not agree that God is the greatest. We consider that there is one thing, there is one thing that is greater than God himself. And that is pure devotion to God. Why? Why do we say that pure devotion to God is greater than God himself? We say it because by pure devotion to God, one is able to actually capture the Lord himself. Srila Prabhupada was before um, one of our deities. I believe it was Sri Sri Radha Londonishvara. And he turned to the devotees and he said, I've captured Krishna and I'm holding him captive in my heart. He said, now you come, you come and take. So Krishna Karshani, the pure devotee, the prema bhakta, they, they actually, they have, they have captured Krishna within the core of their heart, by their devotion. And we'll come back to that in a moment. So let's read something to you. This is Srimad Bhagavatam, 6th Canto, chapter 2, text number 17. And this is just about the, the, um, the power of Uttama Bhakti. Although one may neutralize the reactions of sinful life through austerity, charity, vows, and other such methods, these pious activities cannot uproot the material desires in one's heart. However, if one serves the lotus feet of the personality of Godhead, he is immediately freed from all such contaminations. So it's actually just a sign, one of many verses which talk about the power of pure devotional service. They not only remove the weeds, the you know, clearest of the reactions to previous sinful behavior, but they can actually remove or destroy 
the tendency to engage in that behavior itself, which is the cause of our suffering. So it's, it's extraordinarily powerful. Now, there's one other thing to point out here about distress. There is another type of distress that can come to a, from offenses to devotees. And Marge touched upon this in a previous class. Now, such, um, such reactions to that type of behavior, offenses to devotees, it can obstruct even devotion at the level of ecstatic devotion and it can cause us to be obstructed in going from ecstatic devotion to pure devotion. There's a, when I first heard about this, I heard about it through an example. And I'm going to share the example with you because I think it's such a powerful point that I think many devotees don't know. And I'll explain this. So in the, in the Srimad Bhagavatam, going back to the example of Bharat Maharaj. So Bharat Maharaj, he committed uh, so he fell down from the platform of bhava bhakti now if you read the bhagavatam and i don't have the exact reference but you can find there's a, there's a distinct verse on this when you read the verse it says he fell down due to the reactions of past beha past um, behavior but the acharis explain something very interesting the acharis explain that a bhava bhakti the reactions to one's past material behavior cannot bring one down. So when that verse is explained by previous acharyas, they explain that, that that reaction to previous behavior must be must mean that he committed an offense to great devotees. Because offenses to great devotees can pull one down even from the platform of Bhava Bhakti. So this is just how serious it is and how important it is to ensure that we do not commit offenses in the association of the devotees. Mm -hmm. This is a really, really important point to bring in. And Vishnav Chakravali Thakur explains, the, action, the reaction from offenses to pure devotees are only removed when devotees meet Krishna face to face when they go back to Godhead. That's from Madhuri Kadambini, chapter three, um, page number 27. That's a reference there. So we touched upon the point about the, um, let's go back. This is, this is all talking about how it brings immediate relief from material distress. But the other point, and this is again for sadhana bhakti, is shubhada. Devotional service, even in, at the point of devotional service in practice, it brings all auspiciousness. And this, this is fully manifest. These two qualities, they fully manifest at nishta, at steadiness. So on that route, they're increasing, but they fully manifest. So the relief from material distress and all auspiciousness, they fully manifest when we get to nishta. Okay? So it's interesting. Rug um, Rupa Goswami also says that bhakti is all auspicious, meaning that it produces good qualities. It bestows a superior happiness. It benefits everyone and it attracts everyone as well. In the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu 1127, it is said that there's no other spiritual practice beside devotional service that meets all four criteria. So again, it indicates just how powerful this devotional service is. So this is just some points around the sadhana bhakti. Now we're going to touch upon bhava bhakti. So again, the two qualities that are present in bhava bhakti, one is that it's very rare and difficult to achieve. So it's a very rare and difficult to achieve treasure. The second is that it makes liberation seem completely insignificant. So let's look at this first point. Why is it very rare? And this is very interesting. It's very rare because A, it cannot be attained by our own efforts. In other words, effort alone does not bring one to the stage of bhava bhakti. The second reason why it's very rare is that Krishna is reluctant to give it. And we'll expand on that. So let's look at this. Proper devotional service in practice, and, and I do emphasize proper practice. What does it do? It creates an insatiable desire to attain Krishna and his loving devotional service. But that sadhana bhakti, Proper devotional service in practice is still tainted by matter. And because of that, 
No amount of effort can turn that devotional service in practice into the ecstasy of pure spiritual devotion. It requires something additional. It requires Krishna's mercy. It requires Krishna's mercy in the form of, they call this a ray of prema, right? So like one ray of prema coming through brings that forward, okay? Now, again, really important point here. As it's the first bud, so devotional service and ecstasy, bhava bhakti, as it's the first bud of love, and, and because it eventually brings Krishna under his servant's control, because it eventually, not, not yet, but it eventually brings Krishna under the control of his servant, he doesn't easily give that bhava bhakti. So one must be ready to be ready to do and give anything in order to attain it. Literally, one has to cry for Krishna. One has to learn to cry for Krishna. Um, it's very well known that Gorga Vindamaraj, he would often emphasize that particular point, that we have to cry for Krishna. We have to see ourselves in the mood of a beggar and really cry for Krishna. And Krishna, because he is soft-hearted, he responds when he sees that that person really desires him. Huh? He really, that we really want to attain the goal. Now, at Prema, there are two qualities. So one is this intense, unimaginable intense, it's sometimes called condensed bliss. That's one quality at Prema. And the second is that it's the only way to attract Krishna, Krishna Karshani. So let me read from you. This is Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu 1138. So let's see here. Uh, So this is a description by Rupa Goswami, and it gives a hint of what that unimaginably intense happiness is like. If, if, Brahma, if Brahmananda, or the happiness of becoming one with the Supreme, were multiplied by one trillionfold, he says, it still could not compare to an atomic fraction of the happiness derived from the ocean of devotional service. Okay, so that's Bhakti Rasam Rita Sindhu 1138. And it's really important to understand these things. We, we can use these understandings as a meditation. We can think, we, sh we should think, that one day, by the mercy of my spiritual master, by the mercy of the devotees, by the mercy of Krishna, one day I must taste that bliss. And as we have that meditation, what it does, that meditation will empower and it will, it will surcharge a few things. It will surcharge our determination. You see, what does advertising do? We, we began the talk by talking about internal advertising. What does advertising do? Dhyato vishayam pumsa, right? By contemplation of the objects of the senses, one leads to attachment. By attachment, one has a, a last, let's say, a, a, a real desire, and, and so on and so forth. So when we contemplate devotional service, when we contemplate the goal, when we contemplate and become anchored in what we want to attain, when we understand how attractive it, attractive it is, we become attached to it. When we become attached to it, we become determined to attain it. And when we become determined to attain it, it empowers our practice. We become vigilant to do everything necessary to make sure that I get that which I'm attracted to. So that's why it's absolutely extraordinarily important to regularly hear about what we are doing and to understand the power, the potency, and the pleasure the deep eternal fulfillment that will come by following this path of Krishna consciousness. One other point to bring out here is that real practice, real sadhana bhakti, real sadhana bhakti is to do sadhana with pure devotion as the goal. You see, 
the, the Maha Mantra is actually, it's a Chintamani Mantra. It's a wish fulfilling mantra. If we, if, we, if we engage in devotional service with a different goal, we will actually cheat ourselves of the, of the real benefit. Yeah? If, we, if we desire liberation, liberation also means the desire to just avoid suffering. I just don't want to suffer. If we desire sense gratification, then we will miss out on the real benefit that Krishna consciousness can give us. Okay? So Prabhupada made a very interesting analogy. And, and this analogy um, relates to this idea, because we're now talking about prema bhakti. He talks about this idea of awakening love for Krishna. And the analogy that he gives, he says it's just like a child learning to walk by repeated effort. The reason why the child can, can experience walking by the repeated effort to learn to walk is because actually that, that capability is inherent in the child. If it wasn't inherent in the child, if it wasn't latent in the child, then no amount of practice would achieve it. Now, you can also look at this in another way. We're trying to enjoy the material world. But because we're spiritual, we're spiritual beings, because we're Mamai Vamso Jiva Loke Jiva Bhuta Sanatana, Manashishtani Indriyani Prakriti Shtani Kashti, Mama Eva Amsa. Because we're Amsa, we're part and parcel of Krishna. Because we're eternal parts and parcels of Krishna, no matter how we move around and try to enjoy the material energy, we're never going to be fulfilled by the material energy. Because the material energy does not have the ability to satisfy that which is spiritual, right? The spiritual cannot be satisfied by that which is material. Right? To use another example, it's like if you take a fish out of water, so you take it out of its natural habitat, out of its natural environment, you give it a six-figure salary, you give it a nice house, a nice car, you know, you know different um, association, it, it, it's not gonna actually work because it's failing to address the dharma of the fish. It needs to be in water. And so material life fails to address the inherent nature of the living entity. Jivera srupoi krishna nitya das. And therefore, we, we never get that real satisfaction, that lasting satisfaction that we're looking for through matter. Okay, let's move on. So. It's also important to note here that Krishna's internal potency descends through the parampara, but it's really received by those people who have an intense desire for loving devotion. So there are two things, and I'll just touch upon this, and then we'll open for questions. So in any activity, it has what's called the, its sadhya, which is its goal, and it has a process to achieve the goal, which is called its sadhana, you see? So it's not just that we have a practice, we also have a goal. You know, sometimes um, our tradition talks about sankalpa, right? What is our vow? You know, what is our dhridha vrata? What is our firm vow? If we have the proper goal, it does actually affect our practice, you know? If we have the proper goal, it has, it has a transmuting effect or an alchemical effect on our practice, on our determination. You know? there's, a, there's a famous thing in, in self-development where they talk about how when you want to communicate something to people and really get them to buy into what you're communicating, you should start with why. You should tell them why something is important. Right? So in Krishna consciousness, we have our why. We understand why this practice is important. This is what will be achieved by this practice. So when we reflect upon these things, then we can really understand what we're doing. We become strengthened to do it properly because we understand why we are doing it. And these things help us to really achieve the goal 
and to have a greater experience on the journey. So it's not just a question of some far off time in the future when we actually, um, when we actually become Krishna conscious, but we can really experience the great joy of the journey, right? So we talked about the jewels of the journey. Krishna talks about the joy of the journey. What does he say? He says, devotional service is shushukam. Shushukam kata mavyayam. It is, it is joyfully practiced. Right? It's joyfully achieved. I wanted to end by reading one or two things. So this is from the Nectar of Devotion. Um, let's see. This is about the importance of chanting and preaching in the association of devotees because it is, it is one of the key things that we should be doing, okay? Actually, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just make that point. So Prabhupada really emphasized a couple of things. It's not just chanting. He emphasized offenseless chanting of the Maha Mantra and preaching. And then he says, quote, in constant association with pure devotees. And he emphasizes, as I said, chapter 17 of the Nectar of Devotion, page 112, as a path or the path to perfection. You see? The last thing I'll do before we open up for questions is I'm going to read you something. And this is from Bhaktivinoda Thakur. Because in all of this, the first and foremost practice is the chanting of the holy names of the Lord. So this is a reading. This is Bhaktivinoda Thakur. And he's speaking, expressing the extraordinary potency of the holy name in order in its power to bring the practitioner to the platform of perfection. And this is from um, his song, and this song is called the Sri Nam Mahatmya in Sharanagati. Okay, so this is a direct quote from Bhakti Notarko. How much power does the name of Krishna possess? My heart constantly burns in the fire of worldly desires, like a desert scorched by the sun. The holy name, entering my heart through the holes of my ears, showers unparalleled nectar on my soul. The holy name speaks from within my heart, moves on the tip of my tongue, and constantly dances on it in the form of transcendental sound. My throat becomes choked up, my body violently trembles, and my feet move uncontrollably. Rivers of tears flow from my eyes. Perspiration pours from my body. My body thrills with rapture, causing my hair to stand on end and my skin to turn pale and discolored. My mind grows faint and I begin to experience devastation. My entire body is shattered in a flood of ecstasies. While causing such an ecstatic disturbance, the holy name showers liquid nectar on my heart and drowns me, get this point, drowns me in an ocean of divine love of Godhead. He does not allow me to understand anything, for he has made me truly mad and has stolen away my heart and all my wealth. Okay. So this is one of many statements in our tradition about the power, the potency of the practices of sadhana bhakti and the goal. So in summary, we were talking about how devotional service as given in the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu 1117 has six distinct qualities. And these qualities are experienced in three different ca categories. So we know that there's a category of sadhana bhakti, and that is devotional service in practice. There it brings relief from material distress, and it's the beginning of all auspiciousness. We explain how those two qualities are fully manifest at Nishta. We explain how devotional service in ecstasy, it completely minimizes the value of liberation. We don't, we don't care about being relieved of you know, the suffering of being in the material world. We don't care about it and it's rarely achieved. And then we said devotional service in prema bhakti. So the previous two were devotional service in bhava bhakti, and then devotional service in prema bhakti, in pure love, it puts one in unimaginably, so inconceivable, intense spiritual pleasure, 
and it's the only means to capture or rather to attract Krishna. Okay, so these are some reflections on the jewels of the journey. So we want to use these reflections to, in, to do some internal marketing, to develop our own conviction, which will then empower our own vigilant practice, not just practice, but our own vigilant practice, and will strengthen our determination. As we try to meditate and apply these understandings better, we can be sure of an accelerated quality of devotional advancement because of a greater appreciation for the goal and for the practice. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna hand over to our organizers in order to hear any questions or comments. But before I do that, we're just gonna pass it over to Chandamuli Maharaj. Um, any other seniors who are on the call who would like to make any comments, um, any corrections? So, to Maharaj, Mother Vishaka, anyone else who's on the call, if there's anything that you would like to say, feel free to do so. And if not, then maybe we can open up for questions or comments on this. So what we'll do is we'll open up for questions or comments here. And then as we said in the afternoon session, we'll do a Q and A generally. Over to the organizers. Thank you, Buddha Bhavana Prabhu. We'll wait for Maharaj if he wants to say something and he I'll ask a question. And if Maharaj wants to come online, then we can stop before the next question, if that's okay. Sure. Yes. Okay. So thank you for the jewels. I think it's something that we need to put in our own treasure chest. Um, and then share it with devotees. I think this session was quite deep and very powerful and it's something we need to take on board. I liked your statement you said about Krishna's internal potency is, is delivered by the parampara. I think sometimes we forget that, that you know, our parampara has so much knowledge and power and we should actually imbibe what they're saying to us so thank you for that we have a question and we can go directly on to that question if that's okay Maharaj Maharaj is mute and my microphone is muted so maybe you should maybe if you could unmute mute Maharaj. okay can you hear me we can hear you Maharaj yeah. Yeah, please continue with uh, the questions from the general audience. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the first question is, why do we sometimes have accidental fall downs, even when we have the right transcendental knowledge and the desire to be Krishna conscious? Yeah, it can be also due to previous um, behavior. So one may have certain patterns which are manifesting in the form of certain weaknesses. That's one thing. It could be also due to inattentiveness in terms of our, how we practice it. Uh, practice meaning both lifestyle and the sadhana. So that can be another reason. So yeah, there can be many reasons why there can be, um, you know, accidental fall down. I, one thing to emphasize is that even if one has some challenge or some obstacle, it's a question of what they do, what they do with it, how they, how they respond to it. So some people, they become despondent and they give up completely, which is completely the wrong thing to do. But the actual thing to do is to learn from our mistakes and to, and to apply that learning to become even more attentive, more vigilant, and more enthusiastic in our practice. But if, I don't know if Marge would like to say anything on that. Well, you hit, yeah, usually it's due to inattention and it's also due to past past habits, but it's also due to the, the precariousness of the material energy, which is if you're not very careful at any time, you can uh, slip from devotional service. So of course that comes back again to inattention, but um, 
material energy is constituted in some way, in certain ways, to make to trip you up in devotional service. In fact, uh, Maya is there to protect Krishna against us by making it difficult for us to reach Krishna, and because she wants to purify us. And so it looks like an accident, but a lot of times it's just that we're just, uh, we keep falling into the same patterns. Um, patterns are like, we do something, we get a particular reaction from that. And then we want to avoid the reaction again, but we don't change the way, we don't change the activity that produces it. So uh, in the activity that produces it, it's called our, what we say, our tendencies or our second nature, our, our internal habits that we have developed. So, uh, yeah, it's like, you know, there's, there's, uh, when you go, go around the world, you'll see, you'll see there's certain cultural ca characteristics that are not very good to Krishna consciousness and other cultural characteristics are. So sometimes because we're connected to that culture, those characteristics, because they're our second nature, again, cause us to you know, do something wrong. Just like if you come from America, especially on the East Coast, all the jokes are all, all humor is based on, you know, tearing somebody else up and it's just common you know it's all about putting someone down and making fun of something else who left that everyone else becomes the butt of the joke but if that's it that's it that's the thing that goes on as a normal thing and people in that area don't take it serious because that's what happens but if you if you go outside that you find people who are not used to that become offended by that and if they become offended by that then it's the, the reaction becomes different. So there's cultural characteristics, you know, things that we come up, we grow up with that are not conducive to our spiritual practice, that are habits. Marge, is your microphone okay? We're getting some feedback. Um, I don't, uh, is, am I, is that better? Yes, that's better. With the Bhavana, is that better can you for you? I can hear, I can hear Marge. Yes, it's better now. Okay. Okay. You can take the next yeah. question. Oh. It's my internet, it's not really, it's something, because of this, a, there's, a, there's a pretty strong wind outside. Because of that, it's making the internet a little bit unstable. Right. So we can take the next question. Um, hold on one second, Shilpa Mataji. I just want to add something. Of course. And, and just a remembrance from something that I heard in, in a few classes. And that is that to add to Marge's point, which I think was really powerful, is that, um, see, Maya knows where we're weak. So because she's efficient, she usually will especially try to attack people where they are weak. And if we're honest, we also know where we are weak. So it, one aspect of humility is truthfulness. And so if we can be honest with ourselves and know where the tendencies are which we, in which we are weak, then we can be more careful and vigilant, especially in those areas. So more careful and vigilant generally, but especially in those areas. And, and one example which I heard many years ago, maybe decades ago, in a class is that you have, sometimes have a devotee and he's giving himself, he's really dedicating himself to Krishna consciousness, but he's just very attached to someone who is very like a materially situated person and doesn't want him to practice Krishna consciousness. So, you know, that, that person may send him a gift in the post, they may say how much they miss him, they want to meet up with him. And then, you know, let's say it's a form of boyfriend or girlfriend, and then because of the attachment to that person, they're able to pull him away from the, from the lifestyle that he's chosen to lead because that's where he was, he was attached. That's where he was a bit weak. And if he had been honest with it, he knew that he had to be more careful in that particular area. So even though Maya will try and attack us where we're weak, if we're honest, 
Krishna can also help us, if we're honest, to understand ourselves. Okay, I'm weak in this area. So therefore, I have to be extra careful in this particular area to avoid, you know, moving away from Krishna consciousness. Thank you, Buddha Bhavana. The next question is quite relevant to the current age, actually. It's from Gabriel, and he's asking, in this current Kali, age of Kali Yuga, we are very favorable, favorable with the development of new techno technologies like the internet. Since our Guru Maharaj can enter all our houses and preach widely, is that, is that, i.e., can we hear, we can hear it thousands of miles away, so is that plausible in this age of Kali Yuga? Is that a plus point, basically, in this age to have the internet? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Mark, would you like to answer first? Uh, the question is whether internet is, is... Well, I can give you the general statement by Srila Prabhupada. He said, uh, and he, he didn't just say internet, he said technology. He said technology is neutral. If it's used in Krishna consciousness, it's beneficial. If it's used for something material, it's detrimental. That was Prabhupada's statement about all technology. He said, we will not be interested in developing any of it, but if it's available, we can use it to spread Krishna consciousness. He used the example, he said, you know, um, uh, I was able to fly all around the world and go to many different countries in such a short time because of the, you know, the ability of air, air travel. Before, when that wasn't available, how many people could I reach in my, just in my, in my own little village area? So using that, using that principle, that, and that is Yukta Vairagya. But then again, uh, if it's not, there's a misuse there's a, there's a use and there's a misuse of everything. If it's misused or, or used in the wrong way, uh, uh, then it could, it could take one away from real important activities in Krishna consciousness. We get f fascinated by, the, by technology and we become absorbed in, in the technology itself. We see that a lot with people uh, uselessly just using their cell phone every minute uh, and they actually bec it becomes an addiction technology actually becomes addiction for some people and it causes them uh, various types of mental, mental illness so we also are using it for Krishna consciousness but there is a danger of overuse or misuse even in, even in the realm of Krishna consciousness so that has to be, we have to be honest and say, we'll use it only when necessary. And if we're going to err, err on the side of less than rather than more. So. Thank you, Marge. I'll just add, so there was, um, there was an article I read years ago maybe one year ago, called Persuasive Design. And so what it spoke about was how on most social media platforms, it's designed to get people to be hooked. You see? So for example, many of you will have WhatsApp. So with WhatsApp, when someone's, gonna, when someone's recording a message to send to you, or when they're typing something, you'll see in green, there'll be a message saying, you know, something's record, you know, recording audio, or, you know, someone is typing. And what that does is it actually has a, it has a, um, it creates a habit, right? It, it's actually, that creates a certain addiction, a certain tendency within the consciousness. And there are psychologists who've, who've actually studied all of this and then they put their, their research into creating these platforms. So to echo what Marit said, it's about being very conscious of that because, you know, if we're not careful, then it can really kind of take us over in, in the negative way. And there are many people who are finding now that they struggle to have a, a healthy, balanced relationship with technology, you know, because they're constantly watching it. And if, they, if you, for example, look at the screen before you sleep, 
then it can actually affect your ability to get proper rest, all those different things. So yeah, just to echo that point about being careful in how we relate. One thing that can help to balance or counteract the, uh, the effect of technology is doing things which are more natural, spending more time in nature, obviously, because that's sattvic, and, and practicing Christian consciousness from the, mo from the mode of goodness upwards, that's the best. So yeah, just add that point. I hope that answers your question, Gabriel. Please come online if you need further clarifications. The next question is actually a lovely question as well. It's, can we cry for Krishna sincerely at the stage of sadhana bhakti? Good question. Maj, would you like to begin? Uh, you can cry for Krishna sincerely at any stage when you realize, you know, how much you actually need him. But when it become when you're in the more advanced stages, it becomes it becomes a feature of your devotional practice. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when we cry for Krishna in the early stages, it's usually we're crying because something materially went wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Calling out for Krishna. <laughs> so, crying for Krishna is not so much because of the miseries of the material energy, it's because of uh, actually, you know, we have a loving relationship with Krishna and we're separated from that, that relationship and we're feeling that separation. And there's things that can spark that feeling. Even Srila Rupa Goswami explains that the five potent forms of devotional service, which we mentioned, uh, chanting the holy names, hearing Srimad Bhagavatam, worshiping the Lord and his deity from association with devotees, and living in a holy place. And he, it's mentioned in Nectar Devotion that one can develop ecstatic feelings in relationship to the practice of any of these, even when they first begin their practice of Krishna consciousness. So, but what happens is after we, in the early stages, when we're crying for Krishna, then Krishna starts to somehow reciprocate and help us and give us what we need in order to advance. Then we make a little advancement, and then we become a little bit, what we say, complacent, self-assured, and then crying becomes something that takes a backseat. But the inspiration for crying for Krishna is that you know, without Krishna, life is just, there's no, there's no meaning to life. And it's a principle of love, and love can appear at any stage, but love becomes steady in the higher stages when we become purified from our material tendencies. Love can appear at any time, even from, even with non-devotees, they can experience a loving relationship with Krishna due to certain circumstances. One of those circumstances, everything was in the right place. They were receptive to something. It opened up their heart, and uh, they felt that, that love for Krishna. And in that love, they felt the, the separation from God. But it won't be consistent until we actually purify ourselves from our material desires. Does that make sense? Completely, Marge. Thank you. I have nothing to add. I think it's a perfect answer. <laughs> okay, we'll take the next question then. Another one. They're all anonymous today for some reason, for the Bhavada <laughs> Prabhu. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the next question. How do we present Bhakti's dire view of the world in an attractive way? Um, you don't have to present what this dive view. Uh, you don't, so the point is, we have to present according to the audience. So what it is, so without, without a, an attachment to presenting a negative view or a positive view, what's the best way to present it for the particular audience that I'm dealing with? That should be the question. It shouldn't be that we have to present a negative side or necessarily even the positive side, like what's going to be the most effective. There are some people, they are, um, they're more risk averse. So they, 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 they appreciate hearing about the negative. Some are more 
risk loving or some are more into what they can get but the the end point is we just present it attractively and appropriately according to time place and circumstance so we should just consider that and that's how we should actually decide who and you know, what we present and we should do it sensitively so when we're presenting it you should also be observing how people are responding to see am i presenting it in the appropriate way there were times where Prabhupada he would speak to the devotees and they'd, they'd say, Prabhupada, you know, how do we address or how do we present this part? And he'd say, that's not, that's not what you, you present to a new audience, you know? So you, you don't want to necessarily make, the, make it harder for them to understand Christian consciousness by presenting aspects which are harder to understand or more difficult to digest for no good reason, you know? So we're meant to be compassionate. So compassion means, let me try to think, how can I present this philosophy and the value of this philosophy in a way that is most um, accessible, relevant, relatable to them, while at the same time maintaining the integrity of the teaching. So, Marge, is there anything you wanted to add? Oh, that's perfect, yeah. That was perfect. Your point on being sensitive to see how it is being received is the, is the feature whether you can uh, you can improve on it or change it or whatever and that's important you have to see how it's being received yeah you have to try to see maybe now you can't always see but you have to try to see and i'll just i'll just that's add one to, thing. That, sorry that, that's the main point yeah I'll just add something that we mentioned in our first seminar. See, the teachings are, ex anything is experienced in a certain way according to context. So Prabhupada was giving a class and he was talking about reincarnation. And there was someone in the audience who said, is, who basically strenuously disagreed with Prabhupada. And they said, if reincarnation is real, how come I can't remember it? And Prabhupada said, who said that? And he heard the voice from one, he said, stand up. The person stood up and Prabhupada said, can you remember everything that you did when you were two years old? The person said, no, sit down. And the point that was that Prabhupada had, had given the same point within a, a context. Basically what he had done is shown that just because you can't remember something, it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. The two things are not incompatible. Just in the same way that we don't remember everything that we did in our childhood, it doesn't mean that we didn't have that childhood. It doesn't mean that we weren't age two or age one or within the womb you see so the point is that even with things which are a little bit challenging or may not seem so positive everything is experienced or understood within a certain context it can be within the context of that teaching meaning in that particular verse paragraph chapter it can be within the context of that topic so there's other things on that topic but it can also be within a cultural context so if we present ourselves as very kind as Prabhupada said gentlemen and gentle women then even if people come across things in the teachings which they find harder to digest but still because they heard it from a, a, gentu, a genuine compassionate competent you know caring individual it also it also changes the meaning or how they feel about what they've heard and it makes them more willing to to consider what they've heard as well so I think that's really important to emphasize. Thank you, Buddha Bhavana Prabhu. Just to let you know, Maharaj, Sapa Prabhu has come online. Who? Sutapa. Sutapa Das. Oh, okay. Hare Krishna. Our basis is to Sutapa Sutapa Prabhu. Hare Krishna Sutapa Prabhu. Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj, my basis is to you. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Thank you, for, thank you for blessing our little humble my guest. To listen here. Yeah, and learn from both of you. I'm honored. Thank you. So the next question is actually linked to your previous answer, Buddha Bhavana. And um, they're asking sometimes. Thank you for the insightful class. And she's asking, how can we overcome the tendency of thinking we know it all? 
We've heard it so many times, and of course, we fully understand, fully understand the practice, but we sometimes become blasé and we think, oh, we've heard it before and we know it, but really, it stops us from going deeper. <laughs> Marge, would you like to answer that one? <laughs> uh, you better do it, I think. <laughs> <laughs> The first thing that came to mind is, to be honest, anyone who thinks that they fully understand the teachings, that one thing is a sign that they don't understand. The, the teachings are so, they're so voluminous. I mean, we've even scratched upon the surface. There, there's actually a lot more that could be said about any, any of these aspects or any of these subjects. So someone who feels that they actually understand it, that one thing indicates that they don't understand the teachings. If pe people who, who understand how deep how rich and how extensive the teachings of Gaudiya Vaishnavism are. They know that at any point, whatever they've heard is just a small fraction of what's available because there are so many fine points and so many nuances to the teachings as well. And that, and that doesn't even, that's just the teaching, what to speak about the realization of those points as well, you see? So it, it's a vast ocean, literally a limitless ocean of transcendental knowledge. And then the other thing, is that I remember hearing this in a class by Bhakti Tirtamaraj. He said, if someone thinks that they know, Krishna will allow that person to fall down many times to let them understand that even though you think you know, you don't actually know, that you only have like an intellectual understanding only. And there are also some devotees who, if, if, they, if we take to Krishna consciousness too much on the level of the mind, then if we come across something that does not fit within our mental pattern, our mental jigsaw, then we'll start having doubts. So the point isn't even to just know something, we're trying to realize that and to become that. So really, it, it doesn't even matter if we, if we know it or not. Like, have you, have you realized prema? Have we realized bhava bhakti? You know, do we have that, is that part of our actual conscious spiritual experience to then give that or share that with other people? So those are just some reflections on that particular question. Uh, again, I'll throw it out to Maraj or or the other scene is if there's anything that they'd like to say on that. Well, if we have that attitude, then it blocks us from actually understanding. Even if we know what we're, we're about to hear from someone, we can still learn something more just by listening. And a lot of times when you hear something and you hear the same thing from a different person, it has a different effect on us. So it's a lot of times is that it's not the odd thing so much that you know or don't know. It's the person that's conveying it. Like, how many times did we hear, well, I'm not this body? But usually we remain on a theoretical platform when it comes to under that understanding. We understand, yes, I understand I'm not this body. But, have, but sometimes there have been times when, when it's said, and we're in the right mood of receptivity, we get a realization that I'm not this body. It becomes, it becomes like, yeah, it becomes intuitive knowledge, it becomes realized knowledge. It goes beyond theory. So that's why scripture is repetitive. As Prabhupada said, I have put everything in the first canto and the rest of the Bhagavatam is just a repetition of the same philosophy presented from different angles, that's all. That's why we need to hear over and over and over again. And that's the quality of one who is actually gonna make progress on devotional service. They like to hear. Because they always can learn something by listening. Even if you heard it a hundred times, if you hear it the hundred and first time, you'll learn something new. If you're, re if you're ready to receive the sound without without any presupposed mental conditions that, well, here it comes again, you know. That's why if you, you can listen to the same lecture over and over again, and each time you'll get more and more out of it. Because it's not only, it's not only the lecture or the words, it's you that evolves or devolves, either way, usually we evolve, 
and our ability to understand deeper becomes greater as we go on in life and continue with the process of hearing. So yeah, we should never be averse to, to hearing the same thing again or think we know everything because it says, yeah, that that's an indication you don't know anything if you have the idea you know. And it also says that one of the indications of intelligence is that the more you learn, the more you realize how little you know. When you start getting to that point, then you're starting actually becoming intelligent. We're so small. <laughs> we think we know. That's our problem. The jiva is, is just a little tiny. You know, Prabhupada told that, gave that story to one senior devotee, comparing that particular devotee in the temple compared to the whole vast existence of spiritual material creation existence, and show how that that person is so small, and that and that person thinks they know everything. You know. I'll just add one other thing if Marge is if, if he's completed his answer. Uh, go ahead. Please proceed. Go ahead. Okay, so what I was going to add is also that one of the signs, one of the things to watch out for, and I've had this mistake many times. Sometimes I feel I've understood something, but when I have to explain it in my own words, I realize I don't understand it, or I realize that I've, I've not got a clear understanding, so I'm trying to explain it and everyone's just, co just confused. And that really was a way of me, and I feel it was Krishna's way of showing me, you thought you understood it, but now when you have to explain it and, you, and you're, you're not able to convey that point clearly, it's a clear sign that no, you thought you understood it, but you didn't really understand it, you know? Or, you, or if I shared something, I remember doing some university program and I was getting proud. And so what happened was the day before I'd done the program, it went really well. So the next day I did a program. I think it was, just, it was um, so the first day was an open group. The next day it was, um, we were reading Bhagavad Gita together. It was a study group. And then all these questions came and I just couldn't, and then the challenges came and I just couldn't answer convincingly. And then what happened was other people in the class, they answered that question. And I remember distinctly feeling that, oh yeah, the day before, I was proud. I thought, yeah, I really, I've got, I nailed it. I really understood it. And Christian just wiped me away. The next day, it just completely, just because I said something, it was, there was challenges, there were questions, but what about this? And I just had nothing, I just couldn't say anything. So, that's yeah, awesome. that's also there. <laughs> that's purifying. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's lovely story. Thank you, Buddha Bhavana. <laughs> Gives us faith that we forget as well. Actually, sometimes I forget to ask these questions as well. <laughs> so the next uh, question is from Anjali Mataji. She's asking, what is the symptom of pure love in devotional service? From the example of Bharat Maharaj, does it mean that he couldn't reach from Bhava Bhakti to the pure love? Can fall down happen to pure love too? Mm, good question. Why do I think this is one? This is one for you. <laughs> um, well, it's explained by Bhakti Vinod Thakur, I think, in Bhajana Rehasya, you know, that one can commit offenses even on the level of prema. Only when one sees Krishna face to face, which is a higher high, because high, prema has eight stages. You mentioned the three the three types of uh, bhakti. Sadhana bhakti has two stages. Baba bhakti has six. Prema has eight. On the higher stages of prema, only then can one not fall down. But even on the lower stages of prema, one can fall down. Uh, we have the example of Jay and Vijay who were on the gatekeepers in Vaikuntha. They had committed offenses to the or Kumaras, and they were asked to leave the spiritual world. But that shows that even at such exalted positions like that, it's possible. 
but that was Krishna's arrangement. But still, there is another. There's another reason in there. So yeah. So what is the symptom of a stage of pray, a love where one doesn't fall down when they you meet Krishna face to face? <laughs> then there's no more falling down again. And that's a higher stage of, bak, of prema. So therefore, yeah, uh, one should always never consider some oneself, uh, you know, free from the tendency to fall down. Krishna, Krishna will protect, but what causes people to fall down in higher stages is not material desires, it's offenses. It's only offenses. Because that's the, that's the anartha that carries up to the higher stages of bhakti. Therefore, one has to be careful not to commit offense to Vaishnavas or even to the Lord on the high, on those higher stages. Otherwise, they don't have any material desires. They don't have material tendencies, none of these things. But there is an element of being a little bit, can be, be, a, be a little bit inattentive. And in that attentiveness, they can commit an offense. Mr. Bhavana Prabhu, would you like to add or comment? No, I think that's, that's everything that needs to be said. Thank you, Marge. May we go to the next question? Of course. Amrita Mataji is asking, how does one transform one's consciousness rather than wanting to control situations? <laughs> ah, okay, so, well, it's just, that's, that's the general process of Krishna consciousness. But the other thing is, if we try to be the controller in this world, I mean, you're, you know, there's a lot of competition in this material world. Everyone wants to play God, you know, everyone wants to play God. And actually what happens is if you're, if you're overly controlling of people and you come back into this world, then even in this world, people will try and control you. And then you'll take birth in a situation where people will be overly controlling because due to you behaving that way towards other people, you will then be put on the receiving end of that same behavior. And then the other thing is it's a waste of time because the thing is, whether you control people or not, it doesn't actually lead to happiness. The happiness is not coming from controlling people. Happiness is coming from developing one's own consciousness. So as we said before, it's what's your orientation? Where do you put your time and energy? You know, see, what is it they say? A man convinced against his will, is of the same opinion still. So even if you force someone to do something, they're unhappy about it and they resent you and they try and get you back later on. So better to direct our energies in terms of developing our own consciousness. Now that said, there are practical situations. Let's say you're a parent, you're directing the child, but then you're doing it for the child's own development. You're not doing it just because you have, a, you have a, an overly controlling tendency. Yeah, otherwise there'll be repercussions. What we do to other people is actually what we're going to be experiencing further down the line. So if you don't mind that happening to you, that's one thing. But if you don't want that to happen to you, the better thing is that we make sure that we deal with other people appropriately. Marge, is there anything you want to add? Yeah, when the sun is out, then the darkness goes. So by our own investment in Krishna consciousness, uh, people will gravitate towards us naturally and that it looks like a type of control but it's done from the principle of love people can you know a great soul will control others by his love for others But it's not control. It's just that, you know, that person becomes the uh, the focus. You see that when an advanced devotee comes into the room, everything goes towards them, and then automatically they take control. Why? Not because they want control. It's just that 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 energy of that spiritual energy is emanating from them, and it automatically brings people 
devotees, non-devotees may not be able to recognize that or even experience it. Sometimes to some degree they can. I know certain devotees, as soon as, they, as soon as they walk into the room, you know, everything else stops and all attention goes on them. They don't try to control, but they're controlled by their, they're controlling others by their, by their power of bhakti. <laughs> Shall we take the next question, Maharaj? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Thank you. So the next question is from Mahi. They are asking, how can we understand Krishna's love during this current times and in dark times? How do we find Krishna's light in dark times to help us strengthen our bhakti and faith in Krishna? So basically, I would think, where is Krishna now in this dark time? Okay, so Maharaj, if you'd like to begin, please. Go ahead. I, uh, I think uh, you should take this question. <laughs> maybe we can give it to Sutapa. Maybe he would like yeah. to. Yeah, maybe Sutapa Prabhu, please. Papa Prabhu, are you there? Okay, maybe he's not. Maybe he's, he's stepped away for a moment. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, go ahead. Uh, I think you. I'm sure. I'm sure you. You have the answer all ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, yeah. Where is Krishna in these in these dark situations? I mean, there's many ways in which you can answer this. I um. I read something. I read something, it was like um, maybe a few weeks ago, and it was, um, it was a Christian, um, a Christian preacher. I just have, it just happened to come up, so someone sent it to me, I think. And um, the same kind of question came up, and they're saying that, you know, where, where is God when these dark times happen? And they, they said something very interesting. And they said that we spent decades telling God to get out of our media, get out of our education system, to, you know, to ask him to get out of our lives so much. And then when things go wrong, then we say, where is God? So, and this is not necessarily the way we take it as in the devotee community, but from the more wider world, you know, the, the amount of negative, atheistic, anti-spiritual, anti-godly, not just propaganda, but behavior is immense. And so as a global society, we have asked Krishna, leave us alone, right? We've, we've, kind of, we've kind of asked him to go to the side. We've, we've kind of taken him out of our lives. And this reaction or these situations, this is what happens when there's more kind of materialistic lifestyle, you know? Because a lot of this has to do with the way that we've treated other creatures within the, the natural ecosystem. And I, and I sent someone, I sent a few devotees a quote from Prabhupada. It was actually, it was a, it was a Prabhupada conversation he was having, and um, actually, I'll, I'll read you what he says because because when it, when I um, when I came across it, it was just so powerful, you know. And he was making a point about nature, and he was talking about how um, because of the way that we've treated other elements of society, he was just ba basically making the point that therefore there will be these kinds of negative situations. Anyway, I can't find the quote, but he said, nature is so strong. He was talking about killing of cows. He, he was talking about the injustice of it. And he said, nature is so strong, but for this injustice, you must, there, you know, there must be some repercussions, you know? And he was actually making the point that nature will take revenge. So it's not that, it's not that God has done this, it's that as a global humanity, we're responsible for the situations that we bring upon ourselves. You know, if we act against the laws of Krishna, we create these repercussions. There's, there's one other side, and that is that um, it is also a warning to us as devotees. It is also an indication that there needs to be more acceleration, both in quality and in quantity, in terms of our devotional lives. Because what happens is, Prabhupada said that there should have been a third world war. But he explains that because of the Sankirtan movement, that was averted. And he also went on to explain that this, this Krishna consciousness movement 
will go down in history as being the, the, um, the movement that saved the entire world. What I was reflecting on is probably there should have been many more epidemics, pandemics, but, but what happens is due to the devotional energy that's generated by the Krishna consciousness movement and genuinely God conscious people, it counteracts so many of the sinful effects of Kali Yuga. And in particular, as the scripture says specifically, the, the, the chanting of the holy names has the power to counteract the effects of Kali Yuga. So those are some of the things that we can consider, you know. Now for us as devotees, we should take everything in a transcendental way because the material world is a prison and we're not meant to be here forever and we are meant to leave. Prabhupada sometimes described it like a toilet. You come in, you do your business and you leave, you know. So if we see it in that light, this is this this we say pandemic and people are passing on but every day that happens every day people leave the world and one day that person will be us one day that person that you're hearing about is going to be us and that's inevitable we cannot avoid it but we we can prepare for it by developing the proper consciousness so that we will leave the world victorious and return back home back to godhead Okay. Maraj, please. Any... Yeah, she's asking where is Krishna in all this? He's, he's available if we take shelter of him. He's, he's there by, to uh, help us become more Krishna conscious. By, he allows, Krishna doesn't want these things to happen, but he allows this, these things to happen because they are due to the features of how material energy works. He puts the material energy in, into play. The material energy gives the reactions. And now, when the reactions are not pleasing, then what is the natural thing to do? Is take more shelter of God. So God consciousness, it's un undoubtedly spreading fast during this pandemic. That's where, that, you know, this is actually is accelerating people's God consciousness. I'm hearing so many reports from people who are, you know, coming in contact with devotees during this time and chanting and taking books, you know. I have at least two or three devotees who are drivers, Uber drivers or cab drivers, and they're just meeting so many people. Every every person comes into their cab, they get a book, or they hear, the, they hear about uh, the Holy Name. The devotees are taking advantage of this by uh, reaching more and more people with Krishna consciousness. So Krishna is there even more so now than ever before because he's needed more so than ever before by people in general. We're mindful of the time, uh, Maharaj. So shall we take one last question? Well, it's all up to Bhutta Bhavana how much he wants to do. <laughs> yes, let's say one last question, please. Thank you, Bhutta Bhavana Prabhu. So basically, it's Rita, Rita Mataji, and she just wanted a clarification. She's asking, you mentioned that even Maya is vulnerable. Can you just elaborate on what you mean by that? Even Maya, no, in the sense that the material energy itself is not a strong shelter. In other words, it's vulnerable, meaning that you can't take shelter of, of the material energy and, and feel safe and protected. So yeah, the material energy itself is, 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 is vulnerable, it's weak, it's not, a, it's not a proper shelter. So we have to take shelter in the spiritual, in the transcendental process, and in Krishna ultimately, in order to come back to him. So that was the point I was making. Right, Rita Mataji, I hope that answers your question. I think because that was just a uh, clarification, we'll sneak one more question, Buddha Bhavana, for you, if that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, last one. How do we know what is the particular service Krishna would like us to engage in? <laughs> just ask <laughs> Just follow the orders of your, of your guru. That's fine. Just ask your spiritual master. 
or ask ask those everyone should have someone they work under if they're not if they don't have a spiritual master they should be working under somebody in devotional service so you ask your media authority or your spiritual master that's it. and they and then you get the answer If your spiritual master is not still not is not on the planet, then you could ask your god brothers of your spiritual master, like that. Thank you. Devotees, the devotees like to help others, so go to the proper authority and get advice. Make sure the authority is proper. And proper means they have to know you and that you have to, you know, have a certain relationship with that authority that you can accept what they say based on your faith in that authority. Sutta Papa Bru, would you like to add anything if you're there? I think we can finish here, Maharaj, if that's okay. Um, it's not up to me. Okay, <laughs> Buddha Bhavana Prabhu, is that okay? That, that is fine. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you so much for a wonderful session again. Uh, we will see devotees in two hours' time when our Jankinath Das has got a fun activity. Uh, just to let you know, we've sent an email about... Um, you need to be on kahoot.it so we can do our next activity, followed by questions from our Guru Maharaj and Bhutta Bhavana. We have a panel. We have more questions we haven't answered. So I'm hoping you can answer them later on for our participants. Thank you. If Thank we can you. all unmute three hurry balls. Haribo. 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 Thank you very much. Most appreciate. Haribo. Haribo. Haribo.